Welcome to Observations, wherever you may be. This is the program that is dedicated to providing additional insights and some um, audio commentary on the book called Observations for Our Time. Volume 1 of Observations for Our Time will be uh, available both um, at Claritors, um, which is a short-run uh, a book publishing company, and also at uh, Amazon. Uh, in a, sh- a short run, run to order uh, publication, um, here very shortly. Um, we've <laughs> I've almost finished. <laughs> excuse me. The um, <clears throat> the copy, um, the the chapters for volume two, uh, but. Um, I've got a little more work on the bone there, probably another couple of months before I get all the way through the material that I want to include in Volume 2. But Volume 1, uh, which will get us through Chapter 11, we're in Chapter 10 right now of Observations for Our Time, is nearing completion. So uh, that's an update on uh, where we are. Kirk is uh, with me here today, and we are going to jump right back into where we finished on the Friday evening Shabbat program and the discussions um, that Yahweh had with uh, Abraham. Uh, at the time, now he was named Abram, and these discussions form literally the basis of the relationship that Yahweh is offering to any of us. There is no other detailed presentation of what is required to participate in the covenant and what the benefits of the covenant are, apart from uh, uh, these which uh, begin in Barashith, in the beginning, Genesis 13. So just so we start at the beginning of a sentence, Kirk, I want to jump back into uh, 1314, which reads, Yahweh said to Abram, which means uplifting and empowering father, after Lot, which means concealed from the light, had separated from him. Please, I implore you to lift up your eyes and your perspective and to choose to look From the place where you are, northward and southward, eastward and westward. And we talked about that at the end of the program uh, on uh, the Shabbat uh, program, uh, Kirk. And there are uh, a couple of just really important insights that uh, I want to reemphasize here. The first is, you always said, please. Yes. I mean, that that speaks volumes. Well. What God says, please. I mean, you name a pagan god or a religious god of any kind that says please. Yeah, name name uh, any leader that says please. Yes. Man. Human this leader. is the creator of the universe. This is the author of life. This is the biggest, most wonderful entity, most powerful entity. I can't say in the universe, apart from the universe. Right. Of course, he's bigger than the universe. He created it. Created the universe. And he's saying, please. Of your to own a man. volition. Of your own volition. I implore you. I'm encouraging you. But please. The second thing that I wanted to share is that the next, uh, the verb is to lift up. Up. Mm-hmm. NASA. That's what Yahweh was all about. This notion in in religion that uh, God somehow uh, wants us to lift him up with pr- and praise. You know, praise services are such and such a time on Sunday morning. You mm-hmm. moron. What a disgusting individual you are. To, to demean God to the point that you would suggest that a superior being would create an inferior being to praise him. It's revolting. Can't you think? God, and very few things really upset me more than a praise service or a praise song. Or worship. Can you imagine? Prayer and worship also, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're a pretty down-to-earth, grounded fellow. And so this probably is as, is as impossible for you to picture as it is for me. And I, I don't claim to be nearly as grounded, but I, I would say that the idea of creating, you know, if I had the ability to create a living being, and of course you and I don't, but if we did, can you imagine creating a uh, an upgrade on the garden slug and having that garden slug uh, genuflect and, 
and burp out, oh, oh, oh great Kirk. <laughs> oh, Kirk of my making. <laughs> I love and adore you, Kirk. Let me sing your praises. Oh, Kirk. <laughs> How many times would you have to hear that? I mean, after you just burst out laughing. <laughs> but how many times do you have to hear that? Where the laughter would just go. I said, "Oh, that was really a bad idea." <laughs> and let's be I mean, back here on Wednesday evening. All right, and, around. Yeah. and if you really needed it, wanted it, and enjoyed it, you'd be you'd be a sicko. God's idea is he wants, I implore you, and, and it, because he wants to lift us up. So he's saying, lift up your eyes. Lift up your perspective. You know, stop looking at your feet. Stop looking at the ground. Don't bow down. Look how big the world is. This is just a tiny fraction of what I'm offering you. Look up. It goes on forever. I want you to have the right perspective. And the right perspective is big. Yeah. It's expansive. And choose to look. You know, it constantly encourages to be observant. Yes. There's only one way to observe. You head up. You have to open. <laughs> That's it, man. You observe with your eyes. You don't observe with your nose. You don't observe with your fingers. You don't observe with your your toes. You don't observe with your with anything. You don't even observe with your ears. You can listen with your ears. That's a good idea. But you only listen with your ears if you're reciting his testimony in terms of something meaningful. Mm-hmm. But you observe with your eyes. Look. Be observant. Pay attention. Using your perception of sight. To view, you know, it's um, <clears throat> we were created by uh, God with uh, eyes to see and things to see. Mm-hmm. And when we look at things, Kirk, you're the artist. What are we actually seeing? Uh, we are seeing. Well, first of all, it comes into you upside down. We're seeing light reflecting off of things. So that is it. That's the answer. Yeah. We're seeing light reflected off of things. Is that all we're seeing? I think so. Yeah, probably. I don't think we see, we don't see anything. Yeah, we don't see anything other than light. Yeah. Oh, no, then you'd be dark. You can't see anything. Yeah, we see, we, without light, we would see nothing. Nothing. In fact, we'd lose, our our eyesight would uh, deteriorate and be gone in a matter of days um, if there were no light. Uh, But all we are seeing is reflected light. Now, with one exception, the sun and the stars are not a source of reflected light. They're a source of, uh, of original light. But everything else, I'm looking outside. It's actually snowing uh, outside of my window here. And um, the white of the snowflakes is absorbing no light and reflecting all light. Yes. The black of, uh, of my wrought iron table is uh, absorbing all light and reflecting nothing but contrasts. A little bit of, of That's why uh, you put the highlights. charcoal stuff under your eye when you play ball. So you... That is right. So they don't reflect. It absorbs and it does not reflect. And, you know, the colors that I see out there, the, the greens and the blues and the reds, those are all based upon the... The nature like that, that particular object. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, yeah. It's, some right. absorb, some reflect. Yeah. Yeah. As a matter of fact, what's kind of interesting is that the color that I see, blue, is actually, that object is everything but blue. Because it's reflecting mm-hmm. the blue light. Right. But that is, the, the point I wanted to make is that Yahweh d- describes himself as light. He says, you know, of all the things that that are in this universe, yeah. that you can gain an appreciation of the thing that I most like is light. Mm -hmm. And so our eyes were designed to see light. You think that's a coincidence? Not at all. When God says, I am light? It's part of the grand design. You betcha. We were designed specifically to be able to see him. And you might say, well, I can't open my eyes and see him. If I could see him, you know, I'd believe. Well, if you could see him, you wouldn't need to believe. And I see him. Yeah. 
I see him and and the Yahweh said to Abram after Lot had separated from him, please, I implore you, lift up your eyes and your perspective and choose to look. I see him in those words. Mm-hmm. You know, God's a spiritual being as, as light. There'd be no defining edges or specific colors or contrasts. If you were, if he was specifically here, in fact, if he was, no, all of God can't fit into our universe. A seven-dimensional being can't fit into a six-dimensional universe. No more than uh, Walt Disney could fit into the universe that he created in 2D for Mickey and Minnie Mouse. But if a fragment of him were visible here, it would just look like the sun. It looked like light. And therefore, I couldn't distinguish a thing from his physical presence and yet with his words i see him very clearly contrast and shades perspective personality uh, so you're seeing a guy who's polite who wishes the best for you mm-hmm. encouraging is very encouraging mm-hmm. and provides um and and assures you that he will provide all that you need and who is open and willing to share his uh, guidance, his uh, yes. his instruction as to how you can get the most out of light. It's it's like a father telling a a child, you know, before you run across the room, look up. Mm-hmm. Don't be looking down. <laughs> if you're looking down, you're going to run into a wall. Yeah. Look up. Get your bearings. Get your sense of where you're going. And then, you know, when you go outside, look up. See the world. Take it all in. Get a good perspective. And, you know, there is this uh, notion, Kirk, that, uh, and I think it's true, those who are downcast both versus those whose, uh, whose perspective is elevated, mm-hmm. happy, fulfilled, optimistic versus downtrodden, pessimistic, yeah. subjugated. We should tell you a lot about religion. Yeah. 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 Close your eyes and bow down. Yeah. In fact, most religions would would have you that that's the way that you would approach the religion. Mm -hmm. Eyes closed, head bowed. And yeah, I was saying just the opposite. I want your head raised and your eyes open. That's how we're going to meet. That's how you're going to see me. That's how you're going to learn what what this world I created for you has to offer. Yeah. They're the opposite, aren't they? It's going to re- repeat that. I spent all of yesterday uh, with the word qualm, um, or not all of yesterday, but hours yesterday with uh-huh. qualm, which uh, reinforces that concept completely. Yeah. Yeah. Q uh, U W B. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's the uh, it's the um, verb and a uh, and a slogan that is mockingly used uh, throughout our society. That oh, yeah. nobody's got a clue what it means. Kumbaya. 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 Kum is the verb. Ba is the preposition. Ba means in or with. Yes. And uh, ya is the um, uh, familial, um, affectionate, uh, shortened form yeah. of Yahweh. Yeah. And so kum would be stand with ya. Right. Be upright uh, in ya. Take a stand for ya. All of those things would be uh, true, probably even more. Yeah. And, you know, you're not going to raise your eyes and uh, and look and, and take it all in from where you are, particularly when he says, I want you to look northward and southward and eastward and westward. You can't do that on your knees. You've got to be standing up to do that, don't you? Mm-hmm. So let's, uh, These things are so obvious, and they're even preached on. And they, in the sense that they're rep- the words are repeated, and yes. the connection never seems to be made. No. I would dare say that the, the enlightened insights we have just drawn and conveyed from this simple statement, mm-hmm. apart from what we have shared, has not been shared since they were written by Yashaya 2,700 years ago. It is my conclusion 
that these insights of how important it is that God said, please, how important it is to know that it was Yahweh speaking, how important it is to know that Abraham's name means uplifting and empowering, Mm -hmm. that uh, God's first statement, the first verb there is lift up and what that implies, what it means to open your eyes and gain the proper perspective, to choose to look, to be observant where you are, and then take it all in, all of the insights, including the nature of light and our eyes and these words and what they convey, I don't think that any of what we have just shared has been conveyed in 2,700 years. I have actually heard preachers talk about Lift up, you know, I'm quoting, lift up thine eyes, and as that you said, and then by the end of it, we're bow your eyes, you know, close your eyes, bow your head, and pray. <laughs> you know, yeah, they only excite no, lift up thine agree, eyes because that, that's words, how it's written in the King James, correctly. right? That lift up thine eyes is uh, is the way it's written in the King James. Yeah. So they'll they'll cite that just because you know they they want to be they want to sound, oh, sound, sound religious. religious, yeah. <laughs> But they're not able to show that they have no clue what that means. Thing before you're back right. with your eyes closed, bowing down. Uh, yeah. If you're in a Catholic thing, you have to mm. bow down. You have to get down on your knees. Correct. Because for this express reason, all of the land, the Eretz, the entire region, which to show you the way to the beneficial relationship, Asher, you can see is being observed by you, I literally and continually am giving it to you and to your descendants as a witness forever. So there's no two-state solution, right? (laughs) There isn't even a two-state solution if there were no God. If there were no promise, if there were no God... There is no two-state solution. Just two-state and solution is uh, is, says anyone who utters that is saying, I'm an idiot, I'm irrational, I'm immoral, I have no concept of history, I have no concept of the Islamic religion, I have no idea what is currently happening, I am just so stupid it hurts. That's what it says. It's ignorance personified, even if there isn't a God. Yeah. And because there is, it's blasphemous. All right, so this begins with because. Now, does God need to explain to a lowly man why he's asked him to do something? Uh, no. no. He chooses. However, however if, you're, if you're dealing with a child and you're a parent... And you're trying to raise them. Yeah. Are you going to get a better result if you explain the reason that you're asking them to do something? Or is it you're just trying to impose your will? Yeah, I would think the former rather than the latter. Right. So a parent will explain, a good parent will, will explain the reason that he or she is asking their child to do something because it, it becomes instructive. It becomes an educational opportunity. And more than anything... Then it becomes a a um, a sense of I care about you, which is why I'm sharing this with you. I respect you, which is why I'm sharing this with you, as opposed to I'm bigger and stronger and have authority over you. Therefore, I'm just telling you. Don't ask why. You just do it. You know, like kings and generals, they don't very often explain why they ask you to do something. They don't very often ask. And when they, if they were to, they're not going to explain why. But a loving father will. Because, key, for the express reason. Coal means all. That's all coal means. Coal means. Coal means all. Ha Eretz. Now, Eretz can be region, realm, territory, ground. It can mean the land of Yisrael. It can mean the earth. It's uh, and it can mean really the entire and in, in, uh, material realm. I think all of them are right here. I think Yahweh has given us the entire material realm, including the 
galaxies that are 15 billion light years away. Like he created it all for us, like he's given it all to us. There's covenant children. Mm-hmm. So right. I think it's the entire material realm. All the way out 15 billion well, light as years. As far as you can see, it also includes looking up. Uh, that's correct. To the great dome up there. And you, right. yeah, you can see yeah. Yeah, forever. Yeah. And Eretz really speaks of material realm. Yeah. So, yeah, he gave him the land of Israel. But I think the same is true, this, this concept of he has given every child of the covenant an inheritance which includes the entire material realm, the entire universe. Wow, it's staggering. The, yeah, it's staggering. Now, the next word is, uh, um, is my favorite Hebrew word. Mm-hmm. I've said that so many times. If it wasn't for this word, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be engaged in a relationship with Yahoo. wouldn't be doing this show. I wouldn't have written these books. It all boils down to this word, which when I first reviewed the word, all I learned is it's an association word. It's a, it's a word that d- denotes an association. So, you know, I was studying the, what it was, um, Second Samuel 7 through 11, I guess. And, and um, in every English Bible, it says, when he sends... Now, this is a prophecy that uh, that Hosha would be a descendant of uh, of, Dode, of David. And it says, when he sends, I will not spare the rod. And, of course, when I read that in like 18 different Bible translations, I said, wait a minute. If he sends, <laughs> then he is no longer the perfect Passover lamb. The whole thing is is for naught. I said, now, how can, how can all of these translations be that way? If it actually says this, then people are believing something that is irrational, impossible. Mm-hmm. And, and if it's not that, how could all of the translators be so stupid as to not to figure this out? Yeah, I'm not a theologian. I'm not an expert in languages. But I knew immediately it can't say that. If it's, well, it can, but if it does, throw it away wrong yeah and so i looked up asher and all i had at the time was the strongs you know you won't find asher in strongs in uh, in the core of strongs no. because it's because it's a preposition you'll only find it <laughs> in the back with those other terms that acquire they don't quite know what to do with uh-huh. and the, the sad thing about that is that by doing that strongs completely misses the boat That's why I like other um, lexicons so much better. Mm -hmm. Because other lexicons, you look up Asher, and yeah, the first part will be a a relational pronoun, showing a relationship between things. So, for example, in that passage, when sin is associated with him, Mm -hmm. I will not spare the rod. Well, that makes perfect sense. Our sins were associated with him. But if you read the definitions of Asher, when it's used as a word as a noun and as a verb oh it's infinitely more revealing and and um, powerful than just establishing a relationship that was a conscious effort to do that you think or are they just that dumb i i think that um that what happened is that the first translation was uh, the uh, Greek Septuagint. Now, oh, so uh, now and you know, it's something there. outside of the Torah that would have come during the religious period. You know, okay. probably would have come sometime uh, right around the first, second century. So that was good enough. And uh, and that was good enough. And then the Latin uh, translators didn't know Hebrew, so they they just translated whatever the the Greek uh, scribe and Alexander. Uh, Alexandria had written down and didn't beyond to go, didn't bother to go any further and you know it's that's what happened there and then when you get the first English Bible translations they were all translations of the Latin not of the Greek and most certainly not of the Hebrew so they didn't see any reason to change anything and now familiarity sells so if you were to try to sell a Bible translation about about that, yeah, that doesn't uh, repeat, yeah, repeat the prior mistakes. No one will buy it. Mm. 
So um, uh, that's the answer. Yeah. I mean, it, I don't know if it's one of the words that you've studied, and, and there would be no incentive for you to, because I wallow all around this one, man. <laughs> no, I've, I've <laughs> this is this is my bud. Somewhere on it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is my bud, and uh, you know, and it is. And every time you look at it, it takes you further. Asher is so much more than a relationship. It's to show the way is what Asher means. To show the way to the beneficial relationship. Asher is a blessing which encourages us to pursue life the right way. Which leads to a prosperous and fortuitous existence. A joyful and happy attitude. It's a narrow, restrictive, and straight path through life to life. Mm -hmm. Well, that's (laughs) the theme all the way through. What a marvelous word. uh, Pretty big word. Yes. So why am I sharing this? Why am I asking to look up? Uh, And why am I offering you the entire material realm? To show you the way to a beneficial relationship, to show you the path to life. Yeah. That's why I'm doing it. Now, if you don't look up, Asher, if you don't care enough to you know, look at these jewels, each of these words is a jewel. If you don't care to examine every facet of them, then you'll never know that. If you do, all of a sudden this is singing to you. You know, you're having a conversation, and yeah, I was sitting right next to you. You're side by side. But you've got to look at the words. Because all of the land, the entire material realm, which I, to show you the way to the beneficial relationship, to bless you, to lead you to the right way to live life and to life, I am literally and continually giving it to you and to your descendants. As a witness forever. Now, what had Abraham at this point done for Yahweh? He made big donations? No. <laughs> had he... Uh... <laughs> so far he's walked away. That's about it. And he's, he Established his... a mighty religion? <laughs> uh, no. He's, uh, no, no uh, fought, fought, fought a fearsome foe? Yeah. Why is Yahweh saying, I'm going to give all this to you? It's a gift. You can, you can only see what's in him and what the relationship you know, right. can offer. Now, the only person you would ever do that kind of thing to give give something that's near and dear to you, the, the, the thing that is nearest and dearest to you, the only person that you would do that to is a, uh, is a husband, wife, son, or daughter. That's really it. Yeah. Family. So, Familial. Familial. Yeah, family. So... To say, I'm giving you this place that is the nearest and dearest to me, that I created to engage in a relationship with humankind, says that you may be 70 years old, but I'm looking at you as my son. I'm a little older than you are. (laughs) And so from my perspective, you're you're my kid. I'm giving it to you. Nathan, who? I am actually and eternally bestowing it and granting it to you, offering it as a gift for you to receive, call and perfect, actually and continually, and to your descendants. Wa-la, zera ata. Seed. Yeah. So that your offspring can approach and your seed can draw near as a witness until next week. <laughs> is like coal. Yeah. You know, until Jeebus. Exactly what, what you think it means. It's, it's uh, all, until Jeebus it comes along. Yes, until <laughs> Until uh, Paul contradicts everything that I have written. Comes up with a better plan. Yeah. Until Mohammed <laughs> oh, Mo. vomits out the Quran. As a witness, for, do you think that Yah knows a little bit about Ad Olem as an eternal witness, you, you, you okay, think that when he witness, says "witness the forever," do you think he's a concept of time like that? I think he does. So, is there any chance whatsoever he misspoke? Yeah, that there could be a addendum to this, a, a new deal. 
No. A New Testament? A two-state solution? <laughs> no. A Quran, a New Testament, a Talmud. This witness is forever. And when you think about it, for even a few minutes like this, it's, it's so ridiculous. It, it makes <laughs> makes all the arguments silly against this. I mean, basically, you know, how, how could you draw anything else? All you can do is right. change the words so you don't read it this way. Yeah, either that or ignore them. Yeah. Either twi- 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 change them, twist them, or ignore them. Mm-hmm. Now, those are your uh, your options, or you can reject them. Snore. The snorer or the guy who <laughs> yeah. goes back to Babylon. Yeah, yeah I just don't know how the uh, the Christian and the Muslim rejects them. Or It's, it's just mind-boggling to me because they, they both derive a hundred percent as does judaism Mm -hmm. all three religions derive a hundred percent of their credibility from this text being inspired yeah and yet this text is a hundred percent contradictory in every possible way to their religion it just gets back to the point the only way you can be religious is to be stupid you have to be ignorant and irrational that you know ignorant and irrational the, the simple term for that is stupid about an hour ago, I read uh, the commentary from, uh, I think it's Jim Census, the Hebrew Chaldean uh-huh. um, lexicon, on Yahweh, on Yahweh's name. Mm-hmm. And it's it's about a page of it, and um, small print, a lot of stuff. Every argument is so lame, it's pathetic. It's just totally pathetic. And he's just citing... All these different ones. The rabbis did it this way. They did it this day. They were trying to do this. Da, 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 and they said it was uh, uh, too holy to, sp- to speak. You know, to oh, yeah. uh, and then all these different letters can be pronounced this way. And they used and there are no vowels. And every argument that you've ever written about is is right there. I just had never read it before, but today I flipped it open. And you you have to be an idiot. Yeah. To 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 believe the muck. That uh, Hebrew is a consonant only language and there are no vowels mm-hmm. means that you have to completely ignore the pronunciation of every Hebrew word. Yeah. You have no to vowels. completely, you have to, oh. you have to pretend like this alphabet has 17 letters, not 22. Mm-hmm. And that the words like Torah and Elohim and Shalom just magically appeared uh, pronounceable. And that the letters that provide the vowels in them must just be silent. And somebody secretly figured it out. As a matter of fact, those five letters that can't be vowels in them must be put there just to lead us astray. Because we're not making a consonant sound with them. And they're they're consistently presented as vowels. Huh. I wonder why they're there. It, it's as obvious as the nose on your face that there are five vowels in the Hebrew language. <laughs> and this argument, you can't pronounce the name because it's a consonant-only language, then how in the hell do you learn how to, to pronounce how Torah? Talk? How do you How did you say Shalom? How did Dode know what his name was? Mm-hmm. How did Abraham know who Yahweh was talking to? It's, it's, now that makes it ludicrous. Oh, of course. Now, why in 2,700 years <laughs> we're having this conversation? This should have been so. You know, uh, Kirk, I, I, I'm. Uh, this sounds too incredulous to be true. But I'm going to make the statement anyway, and and if I'm wrong, then I'd love to be proven wrong. In the last 2,700 years, I have not seen evidence of anyone mocking the argument that Hebrew is a consonant-only language. I've not seen anyone say, no, there are five vowels, here's the vowels, here's the sounds of those uh, vowels, and you don't need the diacritical markings to pronounce these words. And that Yahweh's name is as easily pronounced as is any other word in the Hebrew language, none of which anyone argues about the pronunciation. 
All straightforward. Maybe there's somebody else that has done that. Well, I got a lot of books. I ain't found it. I didn't find it either. More, but yeah. <laughs> same arguments. Every argument that you ever has ever been brought up is, is you know. Still... And it might it might sound like for a moment that I'm bragging, saying, "Well, you know, the first no, person it, to do all this thing in twenty No, there, there. It wasn't mark why. hard. It wasn't hard. Yeah. I I don't have any credentials that made it possible for me to do it, and where it wasn't possible for anybody, it was easy to do. Now, I, I will say, we have an advantage. I live in a free society, as do you. Sure. And reasonably free. Yeah. I can choose to spend my time as I wish to spend it. I have access to books. They're not banned from me. Yeah. And uh, I have copies of the Dead Sea Scrolls. I've got copies of the Mesoretic Text. And I have tomes of, uh, of lexicons and dictionaries. And I'm blessed also with access to the Internet. So if I'm looking up a word like today, I was looking up, you know, what's the history of moab mm-hmm. i can google it and <laughs> i can find out a ton you know i've got my own resources and i can google it and find out even more it's just a uh, we live at a marvelous time where we have the tools and the time and the freedom to uh, to do this mm-hmm. but there's seven billion people on the planet kirk yeah why are you yeah well, alone. I mean, I understand why me. I wanted to. I understand why mm-hmm. you. You wanted to. Mm-hmm. It's a matter of want to. It must be. <laughs> I mean, I don't think there's anything more to it you than a want, want to. Want yeah. You want it bad enough, you, you'll say, okay, there it is. Why are so few people, why do so few people have the want to? That's a total mystery to me. I, you know. yeah, and for a time, I will cause your offspring to be comparable to the earth and nature, the afar of the land. So that if an individual is able and capable of understanding the process of deriving a conclusion from this regarding the earth and nature of the land, so also your descendants will be considered. Now that's not the way it reads in your average English Bible. No, not at all. And that what they want to say is your descendants will be as uh, as plentiful as the dust of the earth. Well, that's not true. I don't care how you evaluate the uh, the mineral composition or the particulate composition of uh, of the land of Israel. <laughs> there is no comparison between the the particles that comprise the dirt, even of the surface and people on the planet. Mm-hmm. So, since God created the particulate that comprises the land of Israel and can count how many descendants there were of Abraham, that wasn't what he was trying to say. And would you please tell me, why is it an advantage to have, um, why would it even be considered a benefit for Abraham to have a billion descendants, uh, a million descendants, a hundred thousand descendants, a thousand descendants, or one. I mean, I can understand the difference between zero and one. <laughs> that's the uh, that's family. Mm-hmm. But what's to be gained by going from one to a thousand? It's like you know, it was, there was a program on that my wife was watching when I walked into the uh, bedroom the other night, and it was uh, Sister Wives. Okay. I said, "What's wrong with these guys? Why would you want more than one wife?" I mean, <laughs> that just seems like the dumbest idea in the entire world to me. It did help uh, Solomon, uh, did it? Uh, no, oh. you know, it's um. <sighs> It's uh, marvelous to have a child, a couple of children maybe, three. By the time you get to four, you're depriving one. Of something. Of something. You just don't have enough time to, yeah. to, uh, to give, and it restricts what you can do. So a hundred? <laughs> Sorry, not enough time or love to go around. A thousand, ridiculous. A million, preposterous. 
There aren't there aren't a thousand people out there that I'd even want to be part of my family. Even if given the opportunity to know everybody's character and intellect and contribution and attitude, I think it'd be darn near impossible to find a thousand people that say, "Hey, that would be a good thing. I wish they were part of my family." Yeah. So, well, we're pretty finite beings at this point. Yeah. It's hard for us to deal with that many of anything. So let's consider what these words mean from a cerebral perspective, from a perspective of showing Asher of the path to life and the benefits of the relationship. So, and so that's why I'm, I'm, that's the way I translated it. And I'm, if you want to render it a different way, have at it, <laughs> but it's got to make sense. Yeah. And for a time, I will cause. And this is Sim. For a finite period of time, without ongoing implications, I will actually appoint, put, set, and locate, even preserve. Call perfect. We, we went from the imperfect to the perfect. There's a big difference between those two. You know, from the time of Abraham to the time that this opportunity will end is, uh, you know, what, 4,000 years. Mm-hmm. That's it. Yeah, 4,000 years might seem like a lot of time for you. It isn't much when you're talking about eternal gifts. Yeah. So the time of opportunity to respond to the eternal witness and the eternal gift is limited to 4,000 years mm-hmm. for the descendants of Abraham. So it's a limited period of time that your offspring will be comparable to, ka, will be according to, will be like, by way of, this is a comparison word, the earth and nature. Now this is a far. There, there's, there are three Hebrew words for ground. Adama, which is the primary Hebrew word for ground. It's the, it's the feminine of Adam, the name of the first man. Mm-hmm. So, Adama. Uh, Eretz actually means ground. Yes. And that's why I translate it material realm, mm-hmm. land. Earth in the sense of, you know, the dirt. Right. But afar is literally the particulate, the, the dirt, the dust, the ash, the powder, the ground, the debris, that sort of thing. The, the stuff that is matter. It makes it up. Yeah. yeah, it's matter. And so we are currently material beings. We're physical beings. We're comprised of the elements of the earth. We're a carbon-based life form. We're comprised of matter. We're physical beings. That is our limit on time. Mm -hmm. We're physical beings with a soul that no scientist has ever been able to figure out what it is, this consciousness that animals have. And we're, uh, many of us have, most of us, hopefully, an asama, an ability to reason. But every other part of us is material. Which begs the question, why would you want it later? Yes. You don't want to be risen from the dead. That is, that's why bodily resurrection is a really bad idea. Oh. Being physical is highly limiting. But while this period of time, mm-hmm. while we are comparable to earthen material where we are comprised of we are of physical elements uh, of the land so that if an individual if M on the condition and this is so that Asher on the path to life an individual ish a person is able and capable of understanding Yoko has the ability and the capacity of comprehension. That's the word that changes the definition. Mm-hmm. You know, comprehending how many specks of dirt there are in the land that he could see, or how many and equating that to numbers of people, yeah. that's a nonsensical approach. Yeah, very much. But comprehending that this offers for a limited period of time because we're physical material beings and that has all of those kinds of limitations built into it now comprehending how that fits into this this whole relationship 
that's a catalyst that we can use to expand our horizons. Mm-hmm. But yakol is a understanding word. It's a comprehension word. <laughs> and so is, by the way, the word that follows it. Deriving a conclusion, mana. So if an individual is capable of of understanding the process of law, deriving a conclusion, mana. Mm-hmm. Mana is the uh, you know is, is one of the ma words, <clears throat> and the ma words are all who, what, where, why, when, and how. Those are the questions that you have to ask if you want understanding. Who's talking? Why is he sharing this? When was uh, it, it, was this offered? And you know when will it continue? Tell me when it no longer becomes um, relevant. And to whom, yeah. Yeah. Where was this conversation? Yeah. To whom was it uh, given? How can I capitalize on it? How can I understand it? What is being conveyed here? How does all of this work? Mana is one of those words. It's the... It's the... uh, who, what, why, where, how, and when of this feminine, but it's basically uh, the feminine of ma. Mm -hmm. Determining the quantity of things or assessing their state as they relate to others, contrasting the portion that is fed and favored as compared to the, uh, the whole, assigning and appropriating those who are prepared for man to question the nature of things, particularly food, and especially mana. So God is laying it out. If you're able to understand this, if you can process what I'm saying, then you can benefit from it. The offspring that I'm talking about from Abraham, which are the children of the covenant, are going to have to recognize that they're currently material beings, and that that is what makes all of this time-sensitive for them, even though my offer is eternal. And they need to be capable of understanding, engage in the process of deriving a conclusion by making a connection between all of these things, the smallest details, regarding the earth and nature of the land and also your descendants will be considered. So if you want to be considered by God, this is again mana. If you want to be counted by God, if you want to be known by God, the only way to make that happen is to engage in the process of understanding. Think about what he's saying and make sense of it. Yeah. She'd like to say, yeah, that's uh, absolutely... So he's told you everything, the who, what, the where, when, and why, didn't he? He has, and he will continue to reemphasize it. So this is written specifically to, um, to convey how it is that we go about being considered by God. Because if you're not considered by God, then your soul is going to yeah, uh, yeah. go away. It's going to cease to exist. Your physical body will deteriorate and crumble and... And die, and your soul will cease to exist. I did a bit of a of an analysis. I'll just share a little bit with you. Is it, you know, what may not seem like a lot, uh, uh, but present day Israel is uh, eight thousand square miles, yes. and Yahweh's gift was much larger. Not that that matters in this instance. So, <clears throat> if we were only to skim the surface, one thousand grains times uh, uh, per a thousand grains per square foot times. Uh, 27,878,400 square feet divided by uh, a uh, per mile, I should say, times 8,000 square miles equates to, well, 23 with uh, 3, 6, 9, 12 That's zeros crazy. after it. <laughs> yeah, I guess that would be uh, 223 trillion. That would be correct. Descendants. Mm. And thus a number in the hundreds of trillions. This is an example um, uh, he's just used to say, that's not what Yahweh was talking about. So we have to to get into the meaning of the words. Mm-hmm. Afar, mana, 
understand what what God is trying to get his his uh, Abraham's descendants to think about. Yeah. Did you um did you check these words? Did you find justification for translating this way? I mean, obviously you'll find justification. I mean, for you could say you can count all so, that kind of thing, but it's yeah. just that's the whole context of it uh, speaks against that. I mean, it's not how many children he will have and how many descendants he will have and and or, or the grain you know like the comparison of the grains and saying okay all you've done then what if you got after you did it all you got is okay there's a number right what what do you learn from that what yeah. uh, what, you, what good's and what good's the number yeah so so what okay. so what okay you blessed him and you had a great big family yeah so, Okay, is that the significance? Yeah, you know, he had one son with his wife, and yeah. and that one son uh, had uh, two sons, and one of them didn't turn out to be so good, and yeah. and the one that turned out to be uh, uh, good, Jacob, uh, yeah. had uh, twelve sons. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> That's what I mean. So where do you go from there? Well, well, yeah, big you're whoop. Not going to look up the words a little deeper and say, well, okay, well, what else? Might Yahweh be saying, since how he is the uh, creator of the universe and the smartest guy everywhere, right? In every dimension, so surely he's trying to say something more than that. And of course, uh, we just considered that. And I think uh, I don't, you know, obviously that's what he's talking about. Correct. See the bigger picture. So choose of your own free will to actually stand up, as your friend Coom. Yeah, electing to. Yeah. yeah, well, we'll return. To, I'll be finish the statement and Correct. return to it. Yeah, okay. yeah. Choose of your own free will to actually stand up, electing to walk independently of your own initiative. Stand and walk. There's a good uh, combination. Well, yeah. uh, through and within the land, the material realm, approaching her length, in addition to her breadth, because for you to approach. I am genuinely giving her to you forever. So choose of your own free will. Now, why do you think I I added uh, choose of your own free will to the concept of kum, which just means stand up? Well, I can force you to stand up. I can point a gun at you and you'll stand up. I Mm -hmm. think most people would. So it has to be something that you choose to do because it's a relational thing and mm-hmm. it's a familiar family thing. So you, if you don't want to be here, don't do these mm-hmm. things. He's talking to somebody who yeah. wants to genuinely join him. Yeah. How about own. the fact that it was written in the imperative mood? Yeah, that too. The imperative mood conveys free will in the second person. Mm-hmm. That's what the purpose of the imperative mood is to convey free will in the second volition in the second person. So it was written in the imperative mood to be read, choose of your own free will, choose of your own volition, elect. And I hope this is what you want. It may be what I want, but it's I want you to want it. Yeah. Choose of your own free will. And, of course, the fact that it's written in the call stem, the call stem is not nuanced. It establishes a genuine, actual literal relationship between the subject and the object. Yes, simple active. Right? Mm-hmm. Yep, simple active. So choose of your own free will to actually stand up. Elect to rise up on your feet and take a stand. Become established. Fulfill your purpose. <laughs> enabling the means to restoration. So well, let's see what I got. <laughs> sure. Mm-hmm. On qual, on uh, qualm. <laughs> It answers the question, kneel versus stand upright, first of all. Mm-hmm. When you look up uh, the word, the verb, it says to rise and stand up or stand. And it always means that it's used like 627 times, so it's no, nothing else you're looking for. And then what I did is I looked up how it was used. And mm-hmm. you have, it's, and this was really interesting <laughs> to me, and I won't try, hope I don't bore you all. But no. After lying, it says it's used like after lying down from sleep, and I put in parentheses snoring, <laughs> sickness, and sickness from a plague. Well, how about a plague from plague of death? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the plague of death, which is Pauline yeah, Christianity. We've all, we've all been there, you see. So I'm taking this really personal. I've been asleep. Right. Right. I've, I've snored yeah, through too. life. 
I have, I've, too. I've suffered from the plague of death. And I yes. finally got up and, and stood. Also, is used from, from kneeling, uh, from obedience. And the minute, minute you see that, then you know we're talking about religion. Right. And it's, it it's, the, antithesis, it's the antithesis of kneeling, the antithesis of okay. obedience. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Kum is to be established on your own. Yeah. To it's, fulfill it's your purpose. You from those things. I mean, it's yeah. to be a more obvious separation from kneeling down, or right. laying down to standing up and, and engaging in a walk. Right. Yeah. You know, what's amazing, too, is that kum is written without the hey. You know, the hey is the stand-up word, the stand-up letter in yeah. Hebrew. Yes. I find that a lot of times, you know, well, not a lot of times, but several times you'll find a word that's different. But it's, it is... It is looking at the horizon, and it is has mm-hmm. the next letter is an increase the wall, the increase letter, mm-hmm. and then and it's, you're increased by the help of the set apart spirit, which yeah, uh, the living waters to the yeah. living waters. Yeah, yeah you know, it's, I think it's it's interesting. They would have used cum in this case because the the hay, which is the person standing up, reaching up to God, the hay suggests that you're reaching up to Yahweh's hand. For him to lift you up, yes. and you know he's God saying initially. Just stand on your I, own. I just want Get you up. to stand. I want you to stand on your own, right. so you can walk because we're going to walk together. We got a lot of things we're going to do together, and you know the big, the big heavy lifting I'm going to do later is part of this agreement. But just right now, I'm just asking you to choose to stand up and and let's go take a walk together. Mm-hmm. So, th- so this cum uh, is uh, the first letter is the horizon. Right. You know, he just said, I want you to look up, gain a perspective, look, you know, check out everything that there is to look, see. Look at the earth and the sky. Mm, right, the earth and the sky. And uh, the the letter uh, Q, Kof, is, that's what it conveys. Strong, yeah, strong like a, a line mm-hmm. through the right. horizon, like a setting sun, a right. rising sun. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and the wa is the um, the tent Always peg. Increase. Yeah, and it means to increase, to add to. Yeah, to increase the family, increase you. <clears throat> right. More so, yeah. Right, and the uh, mem is uh, is waves on the uh, the water. Water is the uh, is the universal solvent. God's going to clean us, and it's the source of life. Yeah, the waters of life. That's right. Drinking in the waters of life too. <clears throat> right. Uh, further, it says arise from the state of bending over, or from being dead. <laughs> That's religion. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, rise from the state of bending over and from being dead. Or from being dead, yeah. So that's a, I'm going to, um, if you use this word to free yourself from religion, to separate yourself from religion, rather than die, you'll live. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Then it says uh, it's also used to rise, is to uh, to come on the scene as a leader, a prophet, a king, like a shepherd king. Mm-hmm. Another way is a rise to go somewhere is implied in this. Yeah, you're when you're on your That's feet, you're prepared to walk. You, right. you're, you're readying yourself to go somewhere, go down this path. Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting, too, just the, the antithesis here, Kirk. Mm-hmm. You know, rather than the first thing that Billy Graham would have said is, get down on your knees and, and bow your head and go, let's yeah. have a profession of faith. First thing that, you know, I was telling everyone, get up on your feet. <laughs> Open yeah. your eyes and look up. It's great, isn't it? Yeah. I love the contrast. <laughs> so arise and go somewhere, and then arise to confirm or to establish something. Well, the you know you rise up on the upright. The upright pole was to establish something. Is standing upright. The uh, uh, arise and stand and endure and persist. Now that immediately I went from Yish Sarah El. Yes. And then to establish, and they say, and they, in the course of the lexicons, say to, in the translation from the lexicons, always say to establish the law when I put a question mark. So I looked it up and I said, what are we talking about? We're talking about eduth, which is testimony. Correct. So we're rising up to make a statement of his, or to tell his testimony. Yeah, regarding his eternal witness. Right. We'll be back this Friday. 